And also, if he's elected, then incest is going to become common practice. Okay, that's the accusation against Jefferson. This video is about the Supreme Court's power of judicial review. This is an incredible power that the Supreme Court in the United States has. It's rare in the world today, and at the time that the Supreme Court got this power, it was, as far as I'm aware, entirely unprecedented. That is, there is no court system, or there wasn't at the time, anywhere in the world, where the courts had the power to say of a law passed by the legislature, you know, following the proper procedure, that that law is not law, that it simply doesn't count. Um, so it was at this point in editing the video that I thought, I should probably check with an actual historian. And it turns out that there was some precedent for judicial review in common law in the United Kingdom. But the general point still stands. This was an uncommon and immense power that the Supreme Court has. That's the power of judicial review, and the Supreme Court has it, and there's nothing in the Constitution that gives the Supreme Court that power. There's nothing in any statute passed by the Senate or the House of Representatives or anything like that that gives the Supreme Court this power. Where did the Supreme Court get this power of judicial review? The answer is that the Supreme Court gave this power to itself in a famous court case called Marbury v. Madison, which was issued and decided in 1803. Here's the crazy story of how the Supreme Court gave itself the power of judicial review. You've got two political parties that are vying for power after the presidency of George Washington. Washington was the first, right? And after him, there are two uh, political parties. There are the Federalists. The Federalists, um, they gain power in 1796. And the president who's elected to be the second president of the United States is John Adams, and he's a Federalist. He appoints John Marshall as his Secretary of State. Then, in the election of 1800, Adams is running against a member of this other political party called the Democratic Republicans. And the Democratic Republicans, which are now, they still exist, they're called the Democrats, right? And running for president was Thomas Jefferson. He would be elected president in 1800. The Democratic Republicans are going to win this election in 1800, and Adams is going to be out of power, and Jefferson is going to be stepping into power. And Jefferson's, his secretary of state, right, is James Madison. These are the parties involved. First, you have to know something a little bit if you're going to understand how judicial review really comes about. You're going to have to understand something about John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. They were very good friends. They liked one another immensely, right? Were they best friends before the election? Maybe. I don't know. They were really close friends. But things get really nasty when they're running against one another uh, for the presidency of the United States. At this time, when you were running for president, you didn't, like, travel around the country and campaign. That wasn't the thing that you did. You basically just sat back at your plantation or whatever, and you communicated all the time with various allies all over the country. And your allies were placing stories in various publications and newspapers all over the place. What would happen is that, the, is that the camp, the Adams camp, would place a rumor about Jefferson. And the Jefferson camp would place a rumor in the newspapers about Adams. And it's very hard to trace historically, and I'm no historian, whether or not the order to place this rumor came all the way from the top from Adams himself or from Jefferson himself. But the first big rumor that gets placed uh, in the newspapers during this election is a rumor that's placed by the Adams camp. And what they say is that if Jefferson is elected, he's going to legalize prostitution. And also, if he's elected, then incest is going to become common practice. Okay, that's the accusation against Jefferson. Then there's an accusation publicly made against Adams that Adams is 
a hermaphrodite. Or if the accusation isn't exactly that he's a hermaphrodite, then it's that he has hermaphroditical characteristics. That is, he's not quite a man and he's not quite a woman. That's what's said about Adams. Okay. Um, and then Adams, well, or his camp at least, starts pushing rumors that Jefferson has fathered a child with one of his slaves, which, by the way, he has. Um, but anyway, Jefferson doesn't really like that, and so Jefferson responds, and now, this case, I believe there is actual historical evidence that Thomas Jefferson himself hired someone to start spreading a rumor that if Adams won re-election and got to continue in the presidency, that he was currently planning a war against France. There was no evidence for this. Jefferson just made it up. But enough people were convinced that it was true, enough people believed it, and therefore Jefferson ended up winning the election and the Democratic Republicans come into power in 1800. So the Federalists, they lose not only um, the presidency, but they also lose the legislative branch. They lose both houses of Congress. And now the Democratic Republicans control both houses of Congress. And it was a really nasty election, and so the Federalists, they're pretty upset. And so their move is to consolidate their power in the judicial branch. This is like shady stuff, folks. What they do is they arrange a whole bunch of things quickly. They pass a whole bunch of stuff through Congress while they still control Congress before the Democratic Republicans can come into power. So for example, Adams appoints his own Secretary of State, John Marshall, to, to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. They also um, reduce the number of seats on the Supreme Court so that when the Democratic Republicans come into power, Jefferson can't appoint any justices to fill those seats. So they reduce the number of seats on the Supreme Court. They create a whole bunch of other new federal courts, and they start appointing people to be the judges of those courts. They create, in addition to that, a whole bunch of positions called justices, justice of the peace um, in the District of Columbia, right? These are, well, they're judgeships of a certain kind I actually don't really understand. And um, the president appoints all sorts of people to be these judges, these justices of the peace. So here's what happens. They're scrambling like the day before Jefferson is going to come into office. The day before Jefferson is going to come into office, Adams and Marshall are scrambling to appoint all sorts of loyalists to the Federalist Party to all of these positions in the judicial branch where they're consolidating their power. And one person who gets appointed to this job of justice of the peace is someone named William Marbury. Marbury is a nobody. He's not a very significant figure, except that he was appointed to one of these um, jobs. And as they're scrambling to get everyone appointed, Adams signs the document appointing Marbury to this newly created position, and Marshall forgets to properly stamp the document and deliver it to Marbury or whatever. So Marshall fails in his, you know, secretarial duty of delivering the document or whatever. And then this appointment is just lying around the next day when Jefferson shows up for his first day in office as president, the third president of the United States of America. Jefferson then says to Madison, his secretary of state, don't deliver that. Don't deliver that appointment. We'll appoint our own person. We'll appoint some loyalist to the Democratic Republican Party, our party. Okay, so then Marbury sues. He brings a case before the Supreme Court. He is asking, of course, to be given his job as justice of the peace that the president at the time, on his last day in office, signed that, that gave Marbury that job, that position, right? So he brings, um, you know, a petition or whatever for a, this is going to be important, um, a writ of mandamus, right? A petition for one of those to the Supreme Court. What Marbury is doing is he's asking the Supreme Court to issue an order to a federal official, namely the Secretary of State at the time, right? So a writ of mandamus 
is just an order given by a court directed at a federal official telling that federal official to do his or her job in a certain way, right? And so it's directed at Madison. That's why the case is called Marbury v. Madison. Marbury wants the Supreme Court to order Madison to do something, namely to deliver this document that says that Marbury gets to be a justice of the Supreme Court in the District of Columbia or whatever, right? Now, the, the, this happens in 1801, but the Democratic Republicans in like the 20th shady move of this whole operation, right? They, um, they cancel the 1801 and 1802 sessions of the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court can't meet. But then finally the Supreme Court meets in 1803 and they get to decide the case of Marbury v. Madison. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who's gonna be deciding this case is John Marshall, who just decides not to recuse himself. He doesn't say, oh well, you know, I'm the very guy, the very Secretary of State who was, who, who messed up and forgot to, you know, seal and deliver this appointment. So I'm going to recuse myself from being the judge who decides, or the Chief Justice at least, who decides what, what, you know, happens in this case. He doesn't recuse himself. He gets to decide. But Marshall is in a tricky, somewhat uncertain position. He's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but it's not entirely clear how much power the judicial branch or the Supreme Court really has, right? So if he just issues a writ of mandamus telling Madison what to do, well then Jefferson and Madison might just not do it, which would invoke a kind of constitutional crisis. And he doesn't want to push the power of the Supreme Court too far. But on the other hand, he does want to assert the authority of the Supreme Court because, well, the judicial branch is now where his Federalists have power and so he wants them to be powerful. It's also just kind of a part of the Federalist principles that he subscribes to, his sort of ideology, his political philosophy, is that the Supreme Court should have a significant amount of power. So he's in a tough position and it's not clear what he can pull off. He pulls off the following genius move, right? This case, as a result of this genius move, is universally considered by all constitutional scholars, of which I am not one, right? Is universally considered to be the most important Supreme Court case in United States history. The decision that Marshall hands down has three parts. These are the three parts. The first part is that Marshall says that Marbury is entitled to his position as a justice of the peace. The president signing this appointment, that's what counts. And the fact that the secretary of state has to stamp it or seal it and deliver it, those are just sort of ministerial, secretarial duties. And if they're not performed, then that doesn't really affect whether the appointment um, has legal force. So that's the first part of the decision. And then the second part of the decision is that um, Marshall says that it is correct to seek a remedy for this problem um, in the form of a writ of mandamus directed at the Secretary of State. That is, that's how you fix this problem is that a court has to issue a writ of mandamus telling the new Secretary of State to, um, you know, uh, deliver this document or and make this guy a justice of the peace. All right, but then there's the third part. This is the genius move. Marshall says that the, that the location, the court that has jurisdiction to issue this kind of writ of mandamus, to hear this case, is not the Supreme Court. He rules that his own court can't hear this case. The Supreme Court lacks jurisdiction. Here's how he comes to that conclusion. So you have to know about something called the Judiciary Act of, I think it was 1789. Okay, so here's the thing with the Supreme Court. 
The Supreme Court normally can only hear cases that are appeals of lower court decisions. So a case comes before some lower federal court and it works its way up by appeal. The, that court makes a decision and then the party that lost, they, they appeal to a higher court. And then the higher court makes a decision and then there's another appeal. And the appeals can work their way up through the court system and then finally the Supreme Court gets to hear the case. But there are some cases, and it's specified in the Constitution, there are some cases where the Supreme Court can hear a case directly. Cases, these are cases involving like foreign diplomats or other countries when, or a state within the United States. There are certain cases where the Supreme Court can just right away directly hear the case. They don't have to wait for that case to work its way up to the Supreme Court. On this list, is not, on this list of cases that can go directly to the Supreme Court, it, there doesn't appear anything about the, a writ of mandamus, you know, directed at federal officials. But then there was this, you know, this law passed in the ordinary way by Congress in 1789, the Judiciary Act, and this law added writ of mandamus directed to a federal official onto the list of the kinds of cases that the Supreme Court could hear directly. So the Judiciary Act gives the Supreme Court jurisdiction. It gives it the authority to hear this case and decide this case. But Marshall decides that the Judiciary Act is unconstitutional. That is, he says in this case, Marbury v. Madison, that, well, you can't just add a power to the Supreme Court, to my own court. You can't just, you Congress, you can't just give me some additional power that's not specified in the Constitution. In order to do that, you need a constitutional amendment. So it has to be passed by Congress and then ratified by a certain number of states. Not just some ordinary old law is gonna do it. So Madison just decides he's striking down the Judiciary Act, thereby taking away the authority from his own court to decide a case like this, right? to issue the, the kind of writ that is required to place Marbury in his job or in his position as justice of the, of the peace. And so, therefore, you know, the Supreme Court lacks jurisdiction, it can't decide this case. It was the striking down of the Judiciary Act of 1789 that was the sneaky move. Marshall just decides that he can say that some law is not law, that some law is not constitutional. He says, no, that's not law. He just says it. He just does it in this, uh, in this Supreme Court opinion. And now here's the tricky thing, right? This gives several wins to his opponents, right? This, this decision is a short-term win for Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans because it means that there's no Marbury. It means that they get to pick their own person and put them in this, this whatever job as justice, of the Supreme, as justice of the peace. That's a little nothing win, but it is a win for Jefferson. And the other win is that there's no Judiciary Act of 1789, which takes some power away from the Supreme Court, from the judicial branch, which is the one branch of the government that Jefferson and Madison and the Democratic Republicans didn't just gain power over in the election of 1800. And so it gives them these wins, but it sort of sneakily gives his own party, the Federalists, and his own branch of, go of the government, the judicial branch, it gives his own branch of the government an immense, immense power, which is the power of judicial review. He just claims that power for himself. And then, of course, the trick is that the Supreme Court has to continue to exert this power but not exert it too much, right? So that people don't start freaking out. And so over the course of the following decades and decades and decades, the Supreme Court will continue to strike down laws not too frequently. It will, it will exercise judicial review over state laws as well as just federal laws like the Judiciary Act, right? And it will, it will wait a significant amount of time before it really starts to flex its muscles. Um, and do the official interpreting of the Constitution that it claimed for itself in 1803. The interesting or important part, or I mean there's about a hundred interesting or important or intriguing things going on here, right? But one of the interesting parts is just that you can make up a rule 
and it becomes a rule of a system, right? Whether that system is a legal system, a complex legal system like the United States legal system, or whether it's just a system of rules of games or etiquette or fashion or something like that, you can make a rule of a system just by getting enough people to go along with it. You just start saying that this is the rule. You just start saying that you have a certain authority or a certain normative power. And if everybody just sort of goes along with it or enough of the right people just, just act as if you do have that power, then you have it. That's how the Supreme Court got judicial review. The last thing I'll mention is that after this terrible, awful election of 1800 where Adams and Jefferson were spreading all these nasty rumors about each other, right? And then they were doing all this shady, underhanded stuff to like consolidate power and, and get rid of all these, um, you know, seats on the Supreme Court so that Jefferson couldn't appoint people. And everybody was doing all this shady, nasty stuff. In the following decades, Jefferson and Adams, they like become best friends again. They like somehow in the years later, they become really good friends again and they hang out all the time. Okay, I misspoke here. Adams and Jefferson do rekindle their friendship. They exchange many, many letters, but there's no historical evidence that they actually visited each other at this point in their lives. And they love one another and then they end up dying on the same day. That's the story of how the Supreme Court got the power of judicial review or how it gave itself the power of judicial review.